Good morning. Welcome to Grace Fellowship Church. We're still doing the quarantine thing, so hope everybody's staying safe, uh, enjoying their coffee this morning. We have had a little reprieve today. It was just beautiful up there, a nice north wind. Obviously, this is Friday, not Sunday, <laughs> but, but what a beautiful day today was up there. So uh, we're going to do a little singing, and then uh, Alan's going to bring us a message after this. So we're going to start off with Ancient of Days. song to start off with his kingdom shall reign over all the earth all right holy holy holy
the strength of my heart.
is the strength of my heart. God is the strength of my heart. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God is the strength of my heart. God is the strength, the strength of my heart. God is the strength. My heart and my portion forever. Yeah, God is the strength of my heart. God is the strength, the strength of my heart. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Forever. song that makes me smile god is the strength of my heart always one truth that will prevail and it's god's truth howdy <laughs> Father, we thank you so much for your love. How deep that love is for us. How deep is your grace. Giving your son for us. Just so you can call us your own. We thank you so much that you love us that much. Lord, we just pray for forgiveness. We fail you so many times. But you always are there, arms open wide, waiting for us. 
with that unfailing love. Lord, we do thank you for the sacrifice of your son Jesus upon that cross. And more than that, we thank you for the resurrection. So that he sits at your right hand, interceding for us. We have that intercessor. What a Savior. But we do, again, thank you so much for your love and your grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm continuing in our series in Galatians. It's been a while since I've preached one. Um, we're in chapter 4, and I'm going to start with verse 21 and read through chapter 5, verse 15. Tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman through the promise. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, being children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Sinai, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so it is now also. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. I wish that those who were troubling you would even mutilate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Sometimes there are two ways to do things. For example, if I have five rows and six columns, I can multiply five times six and get 30. Or I could take 
uh, two columns together and make it 3 times 10 and get 30. In that instance, both of those ways work. Or let's say that I wanted to purchase something from a store in Houston. So one way to do that would for me to be to walk from Ballinger to Houston to the store to buy the item and to walk back to Ballinger. Or I could go online, purchase it online and get it in the mail. One of those ways is essentially impossible and one of those ways works. Um, in the case of salvation, there are two theoretical ways to be saved. One is to follow the law to please God. And the other is that Christ fulfills the law for you by faith. And of course, only the second of those ways actually works. Because to follow the law to please God would mean we have to follow all the law all the time uh, without fail. And we all fall short of that. So today we're going to talk about being set free by, by Christ from the law as a means of salvation. The practical application for the Galatians is that they don't need to submit to circumcision. Thirdly, we'll talk about Paul's confidence in the Galatians. Then we're going to see some pictures of being set free, which are given to us in chapter 4. And then we'll see the interaction between those saved by grace and those keeping the law. For first of all, set free by Christ. In chapter 5, verse 1, uh, Paul says that Christ had set them free from the law as a, as a means to be saved. Remember that um, uh, in chapter 4, verse 8, it had referred to the Galatians as being enslaved to gods. They very likely came from idolatry before they became Christians. And they were living by the basic principles of the world. They, they felt that man was basically good and that by working hard you could please these gods. And there was an emphasis in externals. Then they became Christians. But now uh, someone was coming to them and again putting an emphasis on externals. Uh, in this case, the external of circumcision in chapter 5, verse 2. But Paul tells them they're joined to Christ. And, and so Christ is, is to their advantage. They have the Holy Spirit in verse 5, verse 5. And uh, the, the, they had faith working through love in their lives. 5 verse 6. Um, so he'd set, Christ had set them free. And he set them free for freedom. So they were to be serving one another. Verse 13 of chapter 5. Uh, again, they were to be uh, having love, which was in their lives because of faith find that in 5 verse 6. They were to keep the law. Um, we see that in 5 verse 14 where the law says to love your neighbor as yourself. And, and uh, Paul's application of this is they shouldn't be biting and devouring one another. Now, Paul has a practical application of uh, this freedom for the Galatians. And that is they should not submit to the law of circumcision. Circumcision is part of the ceremonial law. Therefore, if they're going to submit to that and be circumcised, they really have to keep the whole law. So if somebody is saying you've got to be circumcised to be saved, well, not only is that true, but if that's the case, then you have to keep the whole law to be saved. And, and that's the problem. Uh, logically, they've been severed from Christ if they submit to that, we've been united to Christ by faith so that his death counts as punishment for our sins and his life counts as our righteousness. But in a way, at least logically, they've fallen away from grace. Grace is God treating us not according to what our works deserve. And if they fall away from grace, that means they have to merit or earn their own salvation. So back to that way of salvation that doesn't work. Any, uh, uh, and uh, that's what 
they should be avoiding. But Paul is confident in them that they really won't uh, fall away. Uh, he's confident, and he expresses that in verse 10 of chapter 5, um, his confidence in them. In verse 7 of chapter 5, he said that they were running well. We see in chapter 3, verse 2, it talks about them receiving the Spirit uh, uh, by hearing with faith. So this is their history. They have, they've heard the Word of God. The Spirit has been at work in their lives. They've, they've had faith. And they have been running well. Um, and it's similar to what we find in Philippians 1, verse 6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now this is, of course, Paul again, but talking to a different audience, the Philippians the same kind of principle, God had begun to work in them, and he was sure that God was going to perfect it. And in the same way, he has confidence in these Galatians. He says in verse 5 that we eagerly await the hope of righteousness. So he, he, he's saying that he and they both uh, are awaiting this hope of righteousness. And uh, there's some pictures that Paul uses of being set free that we find in chapter 4. So the first picture is that of the son or the heir versus the slave. The son doesn't really earn his inheritance, but he is the one who gets the inheritance. Remember, Isaac was the son that God had promised to Abraham. And at age 100 for Abraham and 90 for Sarah, he had Isaac. Uh, he was born according to the promise. So certainly at that age, Abraham and Sarah couldn't do it on their own. Um, on the other hand, Ishmael was born according to the flesh. That was uh, Sarah's idea. Um, she was telling Abraham, uh, well, you know, this is not happening according to what uh, we've been promised. Maybe you should just take my, my slave here and uh, uh, have a child. And so he, he did have a child, but that child was not the heir. A second picture is that of Hagar and Sarah an allegorical picture. Now, Paul is not saying here that he doesn't hold to the um, the truth of that narrative of Hagar and Sarah. He's just saying that you can you can make an allegory of it, and uh, so he takes Hagar as referring to Mount Sinai, which is where the law was given, and Sarah as referring to the covenant of grace that uh, God had with Abraham. So one is standing for the law and one is standing for grace. And then the third picture that he has is that of the present Jerusalem versus the Jerusalem above. And so in Romans 9, 30 through 33, we see the present Jerusalem. Well, what we see, and we saw this as we were in Israel, um, is that the Jews are working real hard to keep the law. We saw them dressed uh, in the dress that they were supposed to be in with their tassels and head coverings. And uh, they were there at the Wailing Wall and uh, working real hard to, to please God. In Romans 9, uh, it says, What shall we say then, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith, but Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed." Okay, uh, but that's the Jerusalem that is here, the Jews, um, uh, Jerusalem standing for the, the Jews and the Jews striving to keep the law. But the Jerusalem above is the church, and uh, that stands for us. Hebrews 12, um, 18 through 24, uh, he's going to talk about this Jerusalem that's above. 
For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched into a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and a whirlwind. Here he's referring to Sinai, by the way. And to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. So he contrasts Sinai, uh, or the law, with uh, the, the gospel, uh, Jerusalem above, which we in the church um, come to worship God in the company of, of other believers, including those who have gone before us. And then we'll talk about the interaction of those seeking salvation by works versus those seeking salvation by grace through faith. And that is that there's persecution by those who are trying to work out their salvation of those who uh, have faith. We find in chapter 4, verse 29, it says that Isaac was uh, mocked by Ishmael. And Paul in chapter 5, verse 11, says he wouldn't be persecuted if he preached circumcision. Because if, if he did, then the offense of the cross would be removed. And this is, a, this is an idea that Paul has in other places as well, the offense of the cross. The cross is offensive to um, the natural man. Uh, and if... If Paul was seeking the approval of men, he wouldn't be preaching the gospel. He wouldn't be preaching the cross. But he says specifically in Galatians 1.10 that he's not seeking the approval of men when he preaches the gospel. He's, he's uh, telling it like it is, not trying to please men. Uh, the cross was necessary, and that's part of the offense. We find in Romans 8, uh, 7 through 8, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. People don't like being told that they're not able to please God, that they're not wanting to, uh, you know, that doesn't, um, that's not what people want to hear. Romans uh, 6, 23 also tells us what we earn. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, men would rather hear that maybe they're just a little bit deficient, and if they work a little harder, they'll do just fine. But God says, no, what you're doing is sin, and the wages of sin is death. It's very serious, and um, you need to deal with that. And that's why the cross was necessary. We find that uh, in Roman, in as John, rather, chapter 3, verse 5, it talks about the new birth, a new nature and rebirth being needed. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Remember, this was Jesus talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a famous teacher of the Jews and if anyone could, could work their way to salvation, it seemed like Nicodemus would be almost there. He's uh, really knowledgeable in the scriptures. And uh, uh, you would have thought, well, Jesus should have just taught him a couple things and he'd be there. But no, Jesus said, no, nope, you, you're not even, you don't even see the kingdom of God. You can't enter it. You have to have a new nature, a rebirth. The Holy Spirit must uh, be involved in this. And so, again... It's an insult to man because it says that man needs something. Uh, he's not good enough on his own. We find in Romans 3.26, For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, 
so that he would be just and the justifier of him who has faith in Jesus. So this is what we see when we see the cross is that God is just. He, he, he punishes Jesus and yet uh, he is the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. And we find that boasting is excluded. So in, in Romans 3.27 through 31. Where then is boasting? It is excluded by what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since indeed God will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised, uh, let's see, since God, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, is one. Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. So, again, boasting, uh, we, can't, um, we can't boast because we haven't earned our salvation. We also see that in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. So that no man may boast before God. By his doing you are in Christ Jesus. Who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So you see, if, if, uh, if it were up to man, we'd pick the people that were um, uh, what we would consider the best. We consider the, those who are rich, those who uh, have a good job, um, those who drive a nice fancy car. Uh, but God doesn't do it that way. In fact, he says, not many wise, not many uh, etc. But it, the, the foolish things of the world, God chooses to save uh, us as sinners. Um, but we can't boast. And then Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, a familiar uh, set of verses. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So we don't boast of our salvation. Now, again, uh, Christ has freed us. And um, as, as those who are free, he wants us to work. Uh, in fact, the next verse talks about that you've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So works is part of what we do, but we don't do it to be saved. We do it because we are saved. So in conclusion... Works cannot earn God's favor. If you take the law and you, you give somebody with the old nature of the law, it just leads to failure to keep the law. And so there's, there's, that doesn't earn God's favor. The cross is necessary. We cannot trust in what we do. Again, the Bible says that all our righteousness is like filthy rags. Um, so we don't want to trust in that. We have to trust in what Christ has done. And we cannot boast in our salvation. Uh, we see that we should follow the law as those who have been set free from the law as a means of salvation. Because of our new nature and our love for God. He, he tells us that in verse 13 of chapter 5. Uh, following the law is part of what we were free to, to do. Um, freedom really is doing what we are intended to do. And man was made in God's image. He was made to love God and to love others. And so if we're doing that because we're Christians, we're doing exactly what God has made us to do. So we're free. It's just like a train. 
A train is free when it's on the tracks and it can move along those tracks. That was what a train was designed for. A fish is free when it's in the water. A fish is designed for that. If you take a fish out in the air, they don't do too good. Uh, but it does very well in the water. And so man is free when he's doing what God intended him to do. We see that faith is necessary. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We see that love is necessary. In Galatians 5, 6, faith works through love. So there is love in the one who has faith. It's characteristic of the new nature that God gives us. And by loving others, we show proper respect to them and we serve them. And as we think about some of the troubles in our society recently, I would submit to you that the gospel is the answer for problems in our society. Discrimination is basically treating someone differently because of the color of their skin. And if we are loving somebody, we treat our neighbor as ourself. It doesn't matter what color a person has. So love will, will automatically overcome that discrimination. If the policeman that killed George Floyd would have loved him, he likely would not have died. If rioters loved others, they wouldn't be killing and stealing. And so you can see how the gospel, as people are saved, and saved to serve God, to love him, and to love others, that would, that would help our society quite a bit. Uh, uh, you would see edification building up instead of destruction and tearing down. Uh, and uh, that's what Paul was talking about in the church. They weren't supposed to be biting and devouring one another in the same way in our society. We shouldn't be uh, tearing down um, each other and uh, hating one another. But the gospel is the answer to those problems. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We know that your spirit is needed to, um, to help us to understand these things and apply them to our lives. And we just pray that... Um, for the working of your spirit, um, for any who do not know you, uh, we pray that you would give them a new nature and a new heart, that they would indeed come to you by faith. Um, we just pray for the, uh, the spirit's work in our lives. Um, help us not to boast, but to re remember that you have saved us and uh, we, uh, we don't boast in ourselves. We can boast in you and your salvation, but not in ourselves. Um, bless each one as we, uh, as we um, go about other things today. Um, help us always to uh, worship you and to, to follow your word. Protect each one and bring us back safely next week. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.